welcome to this regular school committee meeting of Thursday, October 26th. Um, we have no public comment today. I would like to recognize our AEA representative, Julie Keyes. Thank you for being here. And our student representatives, Mo Higginbuke and Amy Colariu. Did I get it right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Grant uh, Minnick is online. Sorry, hi. Um, and we will start with you folks. Oh, yeah. To be honest, not a lot of updates this week. People are kind of <laughs> just doing their academic thing right now. It's a pretty stressful week for everybody. But we're excited for the new building. Sports seasons are coming to a close, so cheer for the um, girls cross country team because they're our Middlesex League champions for the second year in a row, maybe even more. And the fall play is happening next weekend, so you go, should all check that out. Exciting, people put a lot of work into it. Great, yep. okay. Um, next we have the Dallin, or do you want to do the introduction for the uh, steps? Sure. Um, we have two school improvement plans tonight. Dallin and Thompson are here to present, and I'll go ahead and invite you up, Mr. Dingman, first. Um, I'll be driving slides, so let me know when you want to progress it, and I just want to thank the team for their work with a new school improvement plan template this year, um, and a lot of additional support from our Director of Data Research and Accountability. Uh, we've done a lot of work to try to align the efforts of the schools while also providing opportunities for the schools to show their special um, ways that they are adapting the work that we're doing as a district to meet the needs of their specific community. So I'm sure you'll hear a little bit about that. And take it away, I will pull up your slides. Okay. Let me, before I do that, Liz, there, I don't know if this affects our public, but on our screen, there's something in the middle that yeah. doesn't look like it should be there. Oh, I see it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Do you want that sidebar on there or do you want it? Um, we don't need the sidebar. Well, actually, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is, it is, okay, we that's should fine. have that, okay. yeah. We're good. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Did I hear right? This is the last school committee meeting in this room? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. That's really cool. Glad to, glad to set the tone. Knock on for Micah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so thanks, everybody. I'm Thad Dingman. I'm the principal of Dallin Elementary. I'm beginning, uh, this is the beginning of the 10th year at Dallin Elementary. Um, I'm very proud of that. I'm proud to serve this community for the last decade. Um, joined by Samantha Karustis, uh, our assistant principal. Um, she's graciously allowed me to be the spokesperson for Dallin tonight. Thanks, Sam. Um, uh, you got that. Thank you. So uh, tonight, what I hope to go through is um, a few things from the past year that we consider wins and also some challenges that uh, we plan uh, to dig, on, dig in with our teaching team around this year. Um, We'll share our priorities for 23-24, priorities that I think are very specific and important to the community at Dallin, but also um, are moving our strategic uh, plan forward for the district uh, as well. Uh, we'll talk about key initiatives, action steps, um, you know, and our school improvement plan. Slide, thank you. Um, so Dallin Elementary, we're a school of approximately 425 students um, and about 70 plus staff. Dallin, in the past probably five to six years, has peaked at around 500 or, or a little over 500. So um, following the pandemic and in the years following, we've sort of um, plateaued and we remain around 425 uh, students, 20 sections, including um, housing the district supported learning center, um, uh, sometimes referred to as the SLCB, uh, for students in grades K through five. So supporting our community and also uh, supporting our broader community of Arlington students and families. Um, we're very lucky to have the, uh, the engagement of families uh, in our community. Uh, our PTO is thriving. Um, we've seen volunteerism in our schools rebound in incredible ways um, since our pandemic. Uh, we're, you know, all, things like our board seats are all full. Um, our, our meetings are full as well. Um, we have a school council that is representative 
um, of our family population, teachers, and community members, um, and a diversity, equity, inclusion uh, group that is supporting and tending to um, all of the voices uh, in the Dallin community. Um, demographically, Dallin has changed in the last, um, uh, over the last seven years, we have seen particularly the, our community that uh, identifies as non-white increased by 15%. Um, we are seeing uh, more languages in our school. Uh, we're seeing a multitude of families and experiences, and they are asking to participate and be a part of their ch children's education, which is wonderful. Um, Dallin, uh, we prioritize three core values, uh, courage, respect, and responsibility, and we use those core values to lead our work and helping students to think morally and ethically about their experience with uh, themselves and with each other. Slide. Um, just gonna talk a little bit about the, the you know, segue into the uh, teaching team at Dallin and some of our you know, core practices that we believe are important. We've made uh, meeting and, and meeting together in professional time, which we call ACE Blocks, is our collaborative, of Cor collaborative time where we're meeting across roles in the building. Hold on, Mr. Uh, Damon. Which slide are we on? Start oh, one. go back one. Sorry, I just want to say a couple of things Kay. about go. it. Okay, go. What's my, never mind. Um, uh, I, I point this out because what's been very important is teaming, creating collective efforts to support students in our school. Um, so that's making sure that we take our time together very seriously. Uh, we make efforts to bring special educators, interventionists, coaches, um, all in the spaces with our teachers every week, um, following uh, agendas and uh, following data that uh, is collectively identified um, and valued to improve our student experience. And so the professional culture in the school, um, I, I would say is very positive because of that. Um, I'm going to talk more in depth, but uh, we're going to this year and in previous years we have are committed to improving literacy instruction for our students. It's been something I've talked with this group about in the past and we'll continue to talk about. It's an important conversation in our district as well. Um, and also, you know, this year uh, we, we're looking uh, with more focus at our, at our groups within the data that we know. Um, are, whose experience we, we want to shift, we want to um, focus on. Slide. Generally, the data portrait that we've looked at at the start of the year with teachers <coughs> and administrators, um, I would say we see several strengths and we see areas of concern emerge. So academically, the, the school you know, demonstrates impressive achievement. You know, we're an 87th percentile school. You know, MCAS supports that um, our, our students are performing uh, above the state and with the district. Um, we see strong results for students in math and ELA and science as just general statements. Um, but, and we've also made uh, substantial progress in improving uh, our students' progress towards early reading benchmarks, K through three, as we've paid more attention to those. Um, we've been very proud of the shifts that we've seen, particularly coming out, um, again, of the pandemic. Um, but then we also need to continue to focus on some of the inequities that become more visible as we zoom in, looking at things like, in particular, performance gaps that are existing right now between our high needs um, and non-high need populations. Um, particularly when we look at MCAS achievement, that tends to be the, the, uh, the, the key signal to there's something there to understand and improve for our students. Um, high needs is a blanket term. Uh, I think m most folks, probably all folks, have a general sense of what that means. Um, because at Dallin, our, our subgroups are small. Um, students with identified disabilities are a multilingual lingual population. Students who are identified as low SES are small groups. Those get clustered into high needs, but um, there's lots of stories in there um, for us to learn from. So, uh, you know, our, in general, I think our data raises questions about specific challenges that those groups are having, um, thinking about the effectiveness of tiered intervention and engagement of our students, particularly students with disabilities uh, in, in the classroom and within academic discourse. Slide, please. Um, so in our school improvement plan for this year, we're focused on four priority areas, our priority goals. Um, so we're gonna continue to explore and understand our opportunity gap in literacy, um, particularly between high needs and non-high needs population. Uh, 
part of this is the adoption of the EL, um, English Language Arts Curriculum, that is happening across the district. Um, part of it is the expansion of high quality universal screening um, instruments for our fourth and fifth grade. Um, our, our second objective is an instructional objective. This year our school is looking at the use of protocols to ensure equity of voice in the classroom. It's a high leverage instructional practice um, that we know is linked to positive student achievement outcomes for all students. It's a central practice in the EL curriculum that we'll be implementing over the next several years. Uh, and it's a practice that we are um, studying and will be learning from as a school. Um, within the area of equity and culture, we're going to talk a little bit more about our students and their sense of belonging. Sense of belonging is central in our, our um, vision statement for the district. And what we see when we listen and look at student voice is our students who are identifying LGBTQIA plus and our students who are identified as having disabilities and receiving services are having different, are reporting a different experience and a different sense of belonging, a less positive sense of belonging than others, than other groups. Um, and in family engagement, we are working, uh, we plan to work closely with our PTO and our, uh, our staff to make sure that our students see themselves in their school experience, that families see themselves in, in the school experience, and that we are creating invitations um, for families to share the rich diversity of our community in our school. Slide, please. Just want to talk a little bit more about literacy um, and a focus on literacy. Uh, a few data points to look at. Um, we've been, as a school, thinking about uh, the experience of our readers from an early age for several years, um, supporting our staff with professional development, and as a district, supporting them with the tools to attend to and pay attention to early reading skills. Um, so in the middle, you have you know, Dallin, what we look like at year end um, using the uh, Dibbles <coughs> assessment, which is the assessment that we're using um, now K through five to monitor uh, reading progress with students. On the far right, we're looking at the MCAS and a trend line of our high need students and how they're performing on the MCAS assessment. Kind of bouncing, but I hadn't really thought about what the order when I was presenting the school committee. But on the left, oh, it's your, yeah, left, good. Um, is the growth from the beginning of the year last year to the end of the year last year for, stu for our students in K through three, um, looking at the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding uh, bench uh, the benchmarks assigned by Dibbles. So, you know, what do we notice? We see when it comes to early reading skills that our students in K one and two um, have made uh, r really nice gains and continue to make gains. Um, our second grade cohort for last year is a cohort where we, where we um, uh, aside from looking at tier one interventions, we looked really carefully at our interventions as, it, as it's a, just a, a larger group of students that um, need our support. In our third grade, we see 80 to 80% 80, 80 of our students who are hitting those end of um, year benchmarks. Um, but still what we notice in some of our MCAS results is a challenge in how those early reading skills are translating into success in the type of questions and the type of um, ways that, that we're measuring our students as readers. Uh, particularly, uh, what we're thinking about is our students' comprehension and their ability to, to write responses to their reading. Um, the, the one intervention that is gonna be the most impactful for all of our students, particularly when it comes to measuring, using MCAS to measure outcomes, is our EL education uh, implementation. It is a, it is a curriculum that is rigorous, holds our kids to high standards and high expectations, is supportive, is explicit, is teaching them carefully across their years in school um, how to demonstrate their comprehension. They are reading a ton. They are um, presented with complex text, with complex ideas. They are um, reading a range of genres, they are supported. All students are, are, are held to high standards. All students are reading central text and supporting reading central text. It's not a curriculum where students, uh, where the bar is lowered for any particular student. Um, they're learning how to write paragraphs. They're learning their mechanics. These are all areas that when you look deeper at those MCAS scores and you think about where is it that they're falling down and you look at where we're closest to the state in our performance, it's essay writing and it's constructed responses. Mm -hmm. 
and those are where our students need more experiences in the tier one classroom starting at an early age so that they are prepared for that in third grade. And they are, I would argue, they are important skills for our kids to have. They are, that is how they demonstrate comprehension. Our students are learning vocabulary. Our students, um, uh, which is important, and our students are developing better background knowledge um, as a part of their experience starting in K1 and 2. So where we have sort of done a better job at figuring out how phonics, phonemic awareness, um, and those er emerging skills to help students be decoders and fluent readers, we need to give equal attention to students' comprehension sk skills and, the, uh, and language. Um, so, uh, so we have new assessments that we're, we're piling in fourth and fifth grade. At Dallin, um, we have a team that we're developing this year that will closely pay attention to the progress the students are making. So that's reading specialists, coaches, special educators, administrators, um, and teaching teams that will be paying attention to progress monitoring. So one of our focuses this year on improvement is how we progress monitor across the year and carefully progress monitoring um, our, our students in their classrooms. Slide. Um, uh, it's important that, so another area we're working on I mentioned is instructional strategy. So it's important that we are creating a sense of belonging for our students and the way that we believe that we have the most leverage for that is in their classroom experience. And so um, the classroom, we want our classrooms to be rigorous places for all students. Right now what we see is that our kids are feeling uh, and experiencing rigor in their classrooms. However, if we look a little deeper at our, at our so, uh, focal groups, we see that students with disabilities are reporting less or feeling less rigor. Um, so one of our key central practices is classroom discussion protocols. Um, it, classroom discussion protocols are linked to, to, to higher levels of student achievement. Um, a protocol, if you're not familiar with it, is just a structured approach to a, a, a facilitation to a, in a meaningful conversation. So and these would have these happen inside of lessons um, for students. <coughs> Um, the purpose is engagement, active engagement, critical thinking, and equitable sharing of ideas. Um, the things that a, a protocol, what's central in a protocol to us is it's promoting equity of voice. We want to make sure that all students feel that they are participating in a part of the, whatever the activity is in the classroom. Um, and it's also a way that we create um, uh, more participation that are, are um, uh, it, and it contributes to our classroom communities that we're, we're developing. Um, another <coughs> part of uh, protocols for us and what we're thinking about is how we are appreciating different viewpoints in the classroom. We're encouraging students to work across diverse partnerships. Um, there's collaboration, there's teamwork, um, and most importantly, I mean, when a student feels like they are a part of the learning, when a student feels like their voice is heard, they feel like they are more important in their classroom setting. Slide. Um, something that we've been focusing on as a school and as a district for several years is our student sense of belonging. Um, and this year in our goals, we are intending to learn even more and understand uh, why some of our students feel so positive about their student experience and why others are not reporting um, the same. So, you know, what we noticed in uh, the data that you're seeing is student voice data, it's panorama, it's from 190 students who are reporting about their experience. Um, so one of the things that we feel good about is uh, last year our focus was on connection with kids. We noticed that our data seems to indicate we are, our students are feeling more connected. Um, we, that those numbers showed strengthening. Um, we noticed a significant rise in the sense of belonging from our adults. I should talk more about our, our staff, but this was something that we were very intentional about, is making sure that our uh, adult community felt connected to each other. Um, and we noticed great increases for students um, who, who are on IEPs, students who have um, identified disabilities. Um, somewhere in the fall to spring experience, those are real positives for us. Um, you know, where, where I think that there's, uh, I, we have more questions than answers is 
some of the decreases that we notice. And the swings, I think, it should be noted, can tend to be big because our, those groups are smaller in size. But in particular, the theme that emerged in our data is students who identify as um, a gender other than male or female. Um, and so that's one of the questions or identifiers that students are um, provided with. There, we noticed their student experience was less positive, and particularly from fall to spring. Um, and it's a community that, of students that we have tried to create affinity groups and spaces for. We've tried to um, uh, think about uh, the ways that we are allies in creating safe spaces for kids. Uh, we, <laughs> um, I, I, I really feel like our adult community is not satisfied with that, um, with those results. Uh, so for us, to, to see that dip in, those, in this particular focal group's sense of belonging is um, a challenge that we want to take on very seriously. Um, and I'll, you know, talk a little more about key actions in just a second, but um, that particular sense of belonging um, for our students is something that we're noticing and um, are going to act on. Um, slide, and I think the segue between, I want to talk about our instructional leadership teams. Mm -hmm. It's important that we don't stop at surveys. It's important that we don't stop at tests that are already behind us. Um, what, it, it's important that our work, our actions, take us closer and closer to the student experience. Um, our instructional leadership team is something that uh, we, it's part of our district work, it's a part of our school work. Um, they are, they are leading, um, they are on the leading edge of our priorities. So our, our instructional leadership team, their focus this year um, is our school-wide focus is protocols. They're the first to implement, they're the first to open their doors and share with their colleagues. When we're talking about understanding the experience of our focal groups, these folks are already identifying students and going to them and interviewing them and talking to them and bringing that information back to our larger um, instructional leadership team to make sense of and understand. So the thing I want to say about our instructional leadership team, this is an important initiative in our district and these folks are the, the, the model, the role models and the, the leaders in our schools and that's how we're treating it at Dallin. Um, we have a, a great team of teachers who are moving that strategic plan forward, thinking about instructional coherence, thinking about what professional development can look like. On top of all that, what our instructional leadership team um, is intending to work towards this year is more peer collaboration and peer observation. So um, the best learning, I don't, I don't mean this facetiously, too facetiously, but teachers learn best from each other. Like the, the more authentic the experience, the more authentically your, vo your voice is to the work that you do with kids, the more that you learn and listen. So we are trying to cultivate that in our school and our instructional leadership is trying to do that while also moving forward our priorities as a school around um, equitable discourse and understanding the student experience. Thank you. Was that my one minute mark or something? <laughs> so just um, trying to synthesize some of our key initiatives and action steps. Um, you know, we're, we, we are, as, a, as leaders in the school, trying to create a culture of learning where our teachers feel that they are supported by each other and available for each other. And so that's something that is really important for um, Sam and I. Um, we want to make sure that our school is a safe and inclusive space for our families and our communities and our students. And we know that we are going to need professional development and to be very clear about what are the practices that we know um, lead to a student feeling like they belong. And we know that we will do that by learning from our families and learning from our students and learning from, um, well, learning from our community. Um, well, some of our work this year is around more synthesis. We want to combine our groups. So we have an instructional leadership team. We have a school council. We have PTOs. We have DEI groups. We have SEL teams. Um, this year, one of our key initiatives is to bring those groups together more often so that uh, groups, so across roles, folks can see how they are working towards the same outcomes and how we can um, develop more relationships of people who play key roles in our schools, you know, those, those voices that are central. Um, 
and part of that is, again, continuing to cultivate our Dallin ILT. Um, our, da our academic initiatives, you know, something we take very seriously is the, uh, supporting our EL implementation in grades two and three. Um, looking at high leverage instructional practices across the school. Uh, developing a team of uh, interventionists and reading specialists, special educators and coaches as a core literacy team to more closely progress monitor students across the year. Um, and communicate, develop communication systems so that we are more transparent with our community. That's something our community has asked from us and, and you're gonna respond. Um, using assessment tools and also uh, part of our work is we're creating a core experience where students do not miss core instruction um, in any of their, their content areas. And, and that has been you know, really important to us. Um, and importantly, I just wanna say that our teachers, they demonstrate their commitment. All of our teachers have these priorities somewhere in their professional practice and student achievement goals for themselves. So we create common goals across our school so that we're all working towards those same outcomes. Importantly, with a focus on student groups, namely our students who are with identified disabilities and students who are identifying as LGBTQIA+. One slide. And I won't spend a ton of time on this, but if you get it, it's, um, if you have a time to read through, I think we get really serious about what our kid, we believe our kids need and what they want and how they learn best. And um, we sit and craft great plans for professional development and what we think will engage our teachers. But what we've been doing more of last year and this year is just talking with kids and trying to understand where the glows are in their day, um, the things that they appreciate and love, um, and also listening to our teachers to get a sense of where they're at and where they believe that we need to be going. And so I've shared some of those from the empathy interviews as just an example of how it, we really do believe that it's important to go past the surveys and to listen to people and make space to hear their stories. Uh, slide. Thank you, any questions? Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Sutton. Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, I, I want to ask you uh, for the bottom line question as far as we are. You're before us. You're talking about your school, what you're doing, what you see as the next steps forward. What do you need from us? Mm. Well, I think if you ask teachers what they need, it's time. And um, how I think about that is, um, w to some degree, if, if, it, if that was the blanket, we just had time you know, um, to do these things, it probably wouldn't still be enough. Mm -hmm. I think it's time and it's leadership. Um, I take that really seriously, uh, that what we do is intentional. Mm -hmm. um, I think, Paul, you, the continued support of the school committee, I, I've, I, feel, I feel like even when there is hard questions to ask, I've always felt supported and felt like our community supports our schools. Mm -hmm. We need that com continued support. I think we'll, we're going to learn this year, uh, I imagine, as we pay extra close attention to how our, sub our focal group experience mm -hmm. changes. That will impact what we ask and what we say we communicate that we need. Um, yeah, I, the, the one, I, I'm, I, I don't want to use the word concern. I'm impressed by the fact that the district is going through a major implementation of a new literacy curriculum, which is going to take a whole chunk of time. As soon as I heard time, I know that that's something that's got to be eating up a lot for you. Yeah, and how you how you do all do your work. I'm not. I mm -hmm. say like, here's how you should do your job. You know how to do your jobs. Mm -hmm. Protect our schools. Protect our schools from the distractions that will take us away from important conversations about the student experience. Mm -hmm. I've, I've mentioned several times tonight, there are students in our school in third through, third through fifth grade who say, I'm not this gender. Mm -hmm. I'm having an experience that's different. Help me have that experience. Mm -hmm. I do worry at times that as we get very serious about that, how we take care of our educators mm -hmm. and protect our schools in doing that work. Yeah. I've always worried about who's caring for our caregivers. Uh, 
I hear the discussion. I know that there was a major in, impetus in terms of literacy because we saw the need to, to shift our curriculum. And I, I'm glad you were talking about essay constructive response. I think the key word here is discourse. And the more discourse that transpires among students, uh, that's sort of an outcome that usually pops up on the MCAS in those areas. But it, it, that's also a, a way to gain connections. Um, and okay. there's great research base. It, mm -hmm. I mean, student discourse has a great research base in being effective. It, it's always been a key leverage point. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, Morgan. Um, thank you. Uh, so I guess my question, and again, Dallin mirrors the district mm -hmm. in this, so it's the same. Um, so first of all, to Dr. Ford Walker, who have all these slides like mostly look the same, which is amazing. So then like there's like a template and then we can go and like go back and look at the district data and then I can actually ask like a much better question. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so the achievement gap in, in ELA on the MCAS between high need students and all students has never been bigger than it is now, right? Since 2019 anyway. Um, that is, that is the case at Dallin. Um, it's the case in like across our district. So what are the, I mean, obviously we have a new literacy curriculum, yep. right? Yep. Um, we're, you know, we're, we've brought, we're doing more, um, you know, bringing foundations through grade three. Sounds like there's still some like potentially some work to do there in the implementation just because like that's what I think when I see growth from fall to spring is like like we want to see them we don't want to see two percent fewer in the spring obviously meeting and exceeding than we did in the fall right but working on that but mm -hmm. so but w what are we what what do we do about that other than having a new curriculum So I think we measure the efficacy of our interventions. So if we assume that, we have to assume that students who are identified as high needs are in some way known by the school. So high needs is like students with disabilities would be part of that group. And, and that, that is this blanket. It bothers me in the sense that there are very unique experiences even under that. And there's a lot of intersection. I think uh, there is an intersection between disability and our students that are multilingual that um, is compelling and needs closer attention to understand what works for students and for, for students and what we can expect or what we should be doing more of or less of. Um, and I think that I, I think low SES is a, is a, a, a hidden population for us, at least in our community. But it's getting bigger. If you look at our demographics, these are these are groups that are getting bigger for us. But they've been hidden. Their experiences has, have been hidden. And so there's um, lots of great research and lots of great practice that we can lean on. But I think, and I think, we have great dedicated teachers who want to, to see different outcomes for students. So all that to be said, by paying closer inter closer attention, excuse me, to the interventions that we're doing, meeting frequently, and being flexible, we're trying to learn about, you know, learn from this experience and making changes. I mean, there, there was a time, probably, definitely not when I was here, where you would decide on what your course of action is, and that you would stick with it, right? You'd stick with it over the course of maybe a year. Um, we don't do that anymore. We have people who bring in a milieu, like they bring from their backgrounds. And if you put a reading specialist, a special educator, and an MLL teacher next to each other and a coach, what comes out of that is usually different than what you've had in the past. And somebody asks a question that hasn't been asked in the past. So we've already started that work. Um, and then all of a sudden, there, you see folks, when you give that type of agency, like they're leaders on the ground too. So there's this sense of like commitment to students that takes place in creating those structures. So that's what, what we believe. The magic wand like approach, I don't, I don't necessarily have that, but, but um, 
definitely there are instructional practices, instructional approaches that people are trying. Great. Um, and my other question, you didn't touch on it in your presentation, so this feels a little, um, it is maybe unfair, but uh, we heard a lot from Matt Coleman when he talked about absenteeism yeah. um, and like efforts that were being made to sort of work on that. I know that um, in in Karen's presentation, she talks about it and um, I was just curious sort of the, the 30 second version of your sort of philosophy on um, uh, working on chronic absenteeism in your population? Um, developing compassionate, close relationships with families, because they are also experiencing the burden of whatever the core issue is. So I will say that um, this is an area where my partner, Sam, has done a really good job of being more, helping us all be more aware of the patterns of attendance that we're experiencing. Um, and it is, our social workers have never been more important. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Cardin. Um, so related to the, the, the high needs group, um, the percentage of IEPs, the percentage of students that have IEPs at Dallin is quite low at 9.4%. Um, it used to be as high as 14. And the other schools, I mean, you have an, an SLC, so it's hard, hard without taking those numbers into consideration, but the other elementary schools are, I mean, the closest is 11% at Bishop um, and significantly higher at some of the others. So do you think there's something notable there? What, has something changed in the last five years about putting people in IEPs at Dallin or is there anything that, that you've ob observed about that? Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say there's a, like a single story that I can think of. Um, I think that in our work, particularly with the, by, by um, housing the Supported Learning Center, we are acutely aware of disproportionality. Um, I think that has sharpened our practice. Uh, you know, so if you think about our populations where disproportionality and um, disability tend to come together, it's low SES, it's um, uh, black and brown. I mean, these are all populations that are very low for us. <coughs> Um, I, and I think it could in some way speak to the uh, important role that intervention has played for our students, um, how accessible our intervention is for our families. Um, you know, so uh, uh, I would say the expertise of those interventionists too and the impact that they've had on students over time. Um, you know, I think when something I, I look at is if we pay attention to the non-high needs trend lines, they remain pretty stable and high. Um, so there's nothing there that screams, students are, you know, we're missing students, we're lost in, you know, um, we're missing stories. Um, I think we're doing a better job of identifying our students that need the most. And now we need to do what we're talking to Jane about is make sure that those practices are impacting those populations. Great, thank you. Ms. Kittleman. Um, uh, I appreciate your, you know, concern and highlighting the challenges or the decrease <coughs> in, in positive responses for students who don't identify in the gender binary. But I'm, I'm sort of curious because there's three categories here. And the top one, which is how much support do adults at your school give you, it looks like there's been improvement on, right? And it's the other two that are the striking declines. Yeah. And I would love to know sort of what, what you attribute that to and how, you know, if there's something you can learn, and all of us can learn from there in that distinction to help all of these students have a better sense of belonging going forward. Yeah, I have, I have hunches. Um, I think in particular, so one thing I wanna say is we're, this, this group, is around, uh, I think it was nine in the fall and 11 in the spring. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, like when the, when the pendulum shifts on some of these, we're talking about four or five right. kids. So I wanna know what those four or five kids think and what they, how they understand and what they're asking for when they right. respond to these questions. So um, it's like, so when, when, I, when I think is that 
our teachers, what I believe is that our teachers are creating safe spaces in their classrooms for kids, and we need to, and, but we're a very connected school. I mean, Dallin, you know, is like a box, and so we're all over each other all the time, every day, which means we're very visible with each other. When we create a safe space and students feel like they can share the, the fullness of themselves, I, I actually think that that, um, that a student wants to carry that into their school and continue to share the fullness of themselves in all of their spaces. So that, how we do a better job of that okay. is what I believe. And we've, tr I mean, we have tried. We, we use announcements, we use like very visible methods, and I think it's somewhere in the human connection. Okay. But I wanna hear from our kids, and we're gonna have our kids tell us. Okay. Great, I think we should probably move on. Um, what? But <laughs> but thank you very much for coming and for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you. Nice and hot for you, Karen, right here. All right. It's a nice, cool seat, Ms. <laughs> I wasn't sure with the temperature, so I was like, I'm not even wearing a sweater today. I'm just going to come in. Right. It is cool. pineapple time. Um, <laughs> welcome, Ms. Donato. I'm going to pull you. up your slides for thank you. you. And uh, one, Thompson is our biggest elementary school and uh, one that I always have such a wonderful time visiting. And I know you'll hear a lot about what they're up to to make it even more fun this year. <coughs> Thank you. I used to joke that I wanted to be the biggest and now we are, so <laughs> here we are. Uh, Mr. Jakoff and I used to go back and forth. I'm like, I think you're only like five more than me now. Finally, it was our turn. Um, so welcome, I mean, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. My name is Karen Donato. For those who don't know me, I am the principal at Thompson, proud principal at Thompson, and like Mr. Dingman, I have started my 10th year in this position. It feels like I'm new every year, but people call us the veteran principals these days. Um, I'm also here with my wonderful assistant principal, Chrisma Chevalier, who also has allowed me to take the forefront in speaking tonight. Um, our motto at Thompson is to be a pineapple, stand tall, and be your if you ask a student who went to Thompson, will they ever look at a pineapple the same again? I don't think so, right? <laughs> That's it, right? Uh, next slide, please. So I can't actually see my notes, but I can see that. Um, so this evening, my goal is to share with you a little bit about who we are at this moment in time, share some of the highlights about our priorities for this year, and then review some of our glows, which are the great things, and some of our grows, which are things we know we need to work on. Um, thank you, I've got my flow. Uh, this year we are 522 students strong and over about 80 staff members. Uh, just to highlight a little bit of the picture here, the pictures in the middle is a pineapple, of course, it says good vibes, and underneath says amazing things happen here. Something that I hear often, which I think we take great pride in at Thompson, is when people come to visit who haven't been there before, they say, I really like the vibe here. I really like what's going on. And uh, that's so important to us that when people come, including our families and our students, they feel welcome uh, the, minute from the minute they walk in the door. To the left, you'll see a smaller picture, or a picture that we can't see so clearly, but it's Miss Chevalier reviewing our recess expectations with kindergarten over on the, what we call the town side field. Um, we are, have begun our PBIS implementation last year and our core values of being safe, be responsible, and be respectful. And we start the year by going over what that looks like, sounds like in all the various places, including out at recess. And to the right, you'll see a part of our staff at our opening staff meeting this year. Uh, each year I try to surprise them with a theme and this year you'll see construction hats in the picture and we were talking about going back to basics. What are some of the basic things that we need to do, lay out the foundation for us to continue to build um, back to where we used to be pre-pandemic. Next slide, thank you. This is just a little bit about us, um, some of our numbers. I won't necessarily go through all of them, but uh, here we are by class size with our smallest cohort is in fifth grade. We have 76 students in fifth grade, and our largest cohort in second grade is currently at 97. We joke and say the uh, inn is full in second grade. Um, and our diversity is also represented by the pie chart. I'll just highlight, um, but we know that that's a huge piece of who Thompson is and um, the important piece that the diversity plays into our day-to-day -day operations. 
Uh, across the district, uh, average of 3% of students identify as African American, and we are at 5.4%. And across the district, an average of 8% of students identify as Hispanic, and we are at 8.8%, just to highlight a couple of comparisons. Um, we embrace that we get to work so closely with such a diverse and representative student body. And at the bottom is just a quick uh, look at our number of ELL, MLL learners um, with 23 level one and two and 23 uh, level three and four students this year. Thank you. This is just a slide highlighting the four uh, act, uh, school priorities that we're gonna focus on. You'll notice that as an elementary principal team, the four priorities are exactly the same uh, for the elementary schools. We got together early on uh, as the year started and recognized that our data has some real similarities to it and how can we work collaboratively together, collaboratively together um, on some of the areas that we know we all need to improve on, even though it might look slightly different at each of our schools. I was laughing when Mr. Dingman was talking about how, how he was talking about his data charts that he showed because I'm also not going in order. Um, so our first goal is we're gonna continue to address the opportunity gap in literacy between our high needs and our non-high needs students and focusing on the adoption of the EL curriculum. So with the middle graph, you'll see uh, this summarizes our performance of our K-3 to students <coughs> and uh, using the universal screener of Dibbles. We've been able to identify those students who require more detailed targeted in instruction. We're slightly below the district aggregate of 83% and we were at 81% K-3. But we also recognize that over the last few years, the addition of the Hegarty and Foundations programs, uh, those are helping us address some of the needs in our K-3 to, K to grade span. And we know that we're shifting from learning to read to reading to learn at that time. Um, moving to the graph to the right, You'll also, uh, I wanted to highlight that Thompson overall continues to meet or exceed state determined benchmarks for MCAS, MCAS across the math, ELA, and science areas. Uh, but with our continued focus on literacy, our high needs focal groups continue to underperform and our implementation of the screener at these grade levels with the addition of grades four and five helps provide us with additional information for what our intervention should look like at that grade level, those grade levels as we support closing the gap. And with our upper grades, we too are taking a look at comprehension and targeting our, air, our interventions in that area. If you look at the graph to the far left, we haven't done a deep dive yet of, to analyze our MCAS data, but I thought it was important to include this because I feel like there's both a glow and a grow on this. The glow is uh, from 22 to 23, the percentage of our students who identify as African American have, has increased uh, their meeting or exceeding expectations from 23% to 47%. Conversely, there's a grow there in that from 22 to 2023, our students who identify as Hispanic Latino, they have declined from meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA from 41% to 26%. So this is a piece of data that we really need to dig deeper on uh, in the coming weeks with our ILT and during our ACE meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have decided to focus on both uh, K to five at Thompson. We have gra grade one and grade three who are the um, grades who are implementing EL this year. But K to five, we have focused on Two main, of the, two main high leverage practices. Uh, we want to improve general classroom instruction for students and we want to take a look at the use of protocols and deepening student discourse. On this slide, I've just highlighted those two practices. Uh, talks about how uh, we're gonna be working K to five on those this year and we know that if students are more engaged and if they feel seen and heard in their classrooms and throughout the building, then they are more available for learning. All grades are beginning to implement these protocols this year, and that will help support our transition as we go to full implementation of next year, K to five. I wanted to include the short video. Um, I'll give it just a little context before you hit play. So part of what we're trying to do is highlight different protocols that all staff can use K to five in any subject area. So that staff isn't seeing that this is just EL that this is going to be applied to, that these protocols are going to also go across the other subject areas so that students start to 
feel more engaged in what they're doing and also increase their discourse through the use of these protocols. So this is a video that our first grade teacher sent me shortly after we had had our first, our opening day meeting and then starting uh, school where we were taught the back-to-back -back and face-to-face -face protocol and right away this teacher went and started using it even before, uh, you know, we were really got into the nitty-gritty. So this is a first grade class and they are um, practicing back-to-back -back and face-to-face -face, and they are actually using it during their morning meeting share. So it's not necessarily in science, math, ELA. It's something that these protocols are things that can be used throughout the day in different instances. So this is just a short snippet of Do you want me to play it on my computer? If I could put the speakers on. I don't know if it's the public can hear it. Do you want me to play it from my computer? And it won't be seen on the Zoom. But if you play it while I hit play on this, even though it might not necessarily exactly match up, would they hear the? Yeah, if you put your microphone next to your speaker. Yeah, that might work. You ready? I'm not ready yet. <laughs> all right, all right. We're going to hit play at the exact same time. Okay. <laughs> I have to log back in. Sorry. Tell me when you're ready. I have to turn my volume. the mic down by your speaker. All right, ready? Ready. Go. <laughs> oh, nice. Can't hear yours. Okay, so today we're going to do our weekend share with our back-to-back, face-to-face share. So everybody has an idea of what they, what they, um, what they did this weekend. Okay, now turn go face to face with your partner and take a turn sharing with your partner what you did this weekend. When you finish, you can make a tent with your hands. You and your partner make a tent. Yep. When you're finished, you and your partner make a tent. Hands together, just like um, Isabel and Alara. When you finish. Excellent. It, 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 I'm sorry it didn't match up as well as I'd hoped, but it, to me, it was just such a good example of how quickly we can take something that we were learning and put it right into practice and hopefully start to see students become more familiar, more comfortable with using these tools and see that uh, ability to increase their conversation and discourse with each other. So, all right, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide, uh, we're gonna talk about our culture and climate goal, and that's we wanna improve belonging for students and all students across the board. Uh, we want them to be understood as, as people, supported by the adults, um, and feel respected, and have a sense of belonging. So as we continue to grow, as our numbers continue to get bigger, our diversity also increases. And I feel like for years we kind of shied away from um, highlighting particular cultures or maybe particular things because we didn't want to forget anybody. But <coughs> over the years we've realized that uh, that is a practice that when we do those things, other students are also encouraged to share about their own individual cultures, even if it's not necessarily something that we addressed in a highlight. Um, but we want them to, to feel all throughout the building that they have uh, an increased sense of belonging. So on our panorama data, 59% of students in grades three through five had responded favorably when asked, how well do people at your school understand you? And we certainly want to see that increase. We want our students to feel as though uh, they're seen and heard through all aspects of their day. We did conduct empathy interviews at the end of last year with a number of our fifth grade students. Um, and I just thought it was important, I highlighted a few things. 
that they tend to say, the, the students reported that they really feel a sense of belonging at recess and in the cafeteria when they're with their peers. So that, that's the time when they're actually mixed, not necessarily in their isolated classrooms, that when they get together as a whole grade level. And they also reported that they would also feel a greater sense of belonging if the adults at school let them talk like we are right now. <laughs> Literally said, right now. And actually listen, like you're not talking, Mrs. Donato, you're actually listening to what we have to say. And in that moment, I was like, oh, you're right. Like we're taking time, because time is a big thing for us. We're taking the time to actually talk to them, not necessarily about something that's academic or something that may have come up throughout their day that we have to address, but it's asking them a couple questions about how they're feeling at school. What are some things that make them feel like they belong? And um, it was in that moment that I was like, all right, this is something that we really have to somehow figure out how to incorporate throughout the year. Um, and one of the students highlighted that creating the all gender bathrooms and our Rainbow Alliance has also made them feel like they belong. Um, and I just wanted to say that the pictures on the slide, um, they are from our multicultural festival. And I don't know if any, any of you have had the opportunity to come to one. Right now we're doing it every other year. Um, but it is my first year when I went to the multicultural festival, I just, I was so emotional because walking around and seeing our students and their families in our building, so proud of who they are and the things that they do and in their um, cultural, cultural clothing, it just was something that I just felt so emotional about in those moments, in that moment and take great pride in. Um, it was just, it's something that I can't capture, but if you get the opportunity to come, have the opportunity to come, I hope you do. It's, um, it's an opportunity where students can participate in a fashion show and wear something that represents their culture. There's parents and students and caregivers, they bring artifacts from their culture and have display tables and boards. Um, there's activities that families are running um, based on their culture, and it is, it's just amazing. It's really something that captures who we are. Um, and when Thad was talking about um, kind of his PTO and his volunteers and things like that, how that's really strong, we have seen a decline in that, which kind of leads into my next slide in addition to the chronic absenteeism that's on there. But um, due to person power and all that goes into running an event like that, we've shifted from every year to every other year. Um, so there's, there's pieces like that that due to some circumstances that, that we weren't prepared for. We weren't able to keep this going every year, but we do get volunteerism right now every other year. Uh, leading to the next slide. So this slide represents, and I, I just put this piece on it because I think this is a, a piece of the puzzle for us. Um, there's a lot of different things that I think can go into um, a sense of belonging for our families and re-engaging our families. Um, so just speaking to the table, we know that our attendance rate is slightly lower than the district average. Uh, we also see that for our focal groups, the rate is cause for concern, and this is something we really need to focus on. I looked at the second to last column on the right, the chronically, the percentage of chronically absent, 10% um, or more. And when you look at our families who identify as low income, high needs, um, our students with disabilities, and then our African American and Hispanic or Latino students, those numbers are particularly high. Uh, our Hispanic population's chronic absenteeism is almost double, is more than double than all students. Um, so this goes back to some of the ways that we want to engage our families so that they feel that they have a voice at the table, that they feel that um, their, who they are matters and with our ILT, ILT, we want to increase the ways that we communicate with families. Um, we've done some various things over the years, but it's still not the one thing, the lever, the one thing that's going to reach all of our families. So how can we really take a look at who is actually either not attending events, who's not signing up for parent-teacher conferences, um, who are our students who are chronically absent, and you know, there's a whole host of reasons and different things, but the fact remains that those numbers are high. And we need our students in school so that 
they can engage, that they can feel that they are part of the community, that they can be available for learning and show their own academic growth. Um, so that is a, a big focus of the work I want to do this year with our ILT. And what are some of the ways that we as individuals in the school, not just looking at the school as a whole, but the individual people at the school, what can we do differently? What can we tap into that's going to help increase our communication with families, support them, and support their students? All right. Last, next slide. Almost last slide. Um, this is just a few of our glows. Um, we've expanded our ILT, which I think is really important. We didn't have all grade levels represented last year. We didn't have um, staff who were ready to participate. We, were, we have service providers, support staff, specialists, and coaches as part of our team. Um, we are regu regularly using ACE time so that staff can collaborate and look at data, and we can talk about some of our instructional practices. Um, math was a, a part of our focus from our SIP last year, including student discourse, uh, specifically in math. And just overall, we've seen some growth. We've seen growth in our math uh, scaled, score, scaled scores and growth percentiles. Um, our PBIS team continues to grow, and our implementation has been strong, thankfully, under the direction of Ms. Chevalier. Um, and we're consistently working with students on holding them to high expectations in all areas of the school. Uh, we had partnership, and we continue to partnership with We the People for enrichment for students and professional development for staff about being culturally responsive, and a partnership with PFLAG for professional development for staff around supporting our LGBTQIA plus students. Slide, please. And our GROWS, we want to increase our participation in our Panorama survey. Uh, as I mentioned before, our students uh, who identify as Hispanic and African American have significantly higher rates of absenteeism, and we want to uh, work to understand that and improve upon that. Increase our communication with caregivers around student progress, as well as opportunities to come to school events with their student. Um, something that we've talked about under that is that I feel like we had reached a nice rhythm of grade levels, inviting families in during the school day or hosting evening events before the pandemic. We'd have a math night. We'd have a literacy night. Um, we'd have volunteers. We'd have teachers. We would have um, teachers have parents in during the school day if they were available. And I feel like we had gotten away from some of those things and we're slowly getting back into that. Um, but that's an area that we really want to focus on across all grade levels this year is making sure we're providing opportunities for families to actually come into the classroom to see and be with their students in class and experience some of the things that are happening for them there. And then a grow and something that I'd like to particularly focus on, um, and I know as an administrative team, we want to provide dedicated time and space to meet with specific caregiver populations so that we are hearing from them directly things that may be going well, things that they need our support in, and things that we need to do to improve in order to support them um, so that we can elevate their voices in our school community. I feel like we work really hard with our students and provide for them in all ways, even beyond the school walls, and there's still a missing piece in connecting with the adults in their lives on a regular basis. Uh, not that we don't connect with them, but how can we consistently connect with them and bring them into the day-to-day -day things that are happening in the school, not just parent-teacher conference or this event that we're having or a phone call. Um, we want to hear from our, our specific populations of the things that we need to do um, so that they feel a part of our community more deeply. Great. Thank you. Questions? Ms. Exley? Thank you for this presentation. Um, and I as you were giving this presentation, I remember last year, um, it, there was, there felt like so there was some struggle for you, and this year, this presentation felt like things feel better, so I hope that that is Thank the you. case for you, and I hope that um, last year went okay, but what I, um, what I wanted to mention or say was that as you were talking about the absenteeism, um, I was sort of thinking, like, what can we as a school committee, what supports, you, you know, would would Thompson benefit from, you know, what does the district need? And then you sort of shared this in your growth, but I'm, I'm just wondering what, um, what relationship you have with the, um, 
the uh, Welcome Center and the Director of Community and Family Engagement and how can that department help you um, with, with some of these ideas that you have here? Sure. I think that's going to be huge. Um, we, I've already had lots of conversations with uh, Wesley or Ms. Pierre and you know we are tossing around different ideas about how we can communicate, how teachers themselves can communicate more effectively and efficiently with families who may not speak English. Right now, um, we, don't ha we don't have a particular um, platform that all teachers can access for translation. We have Lexikeet, we use that. Um, it's not as quick and easy as we want it to be. How can we quickly get messages to families? How can we quickly reach out to a parent? Um, ne not necessarily giving teachers using their cell phones or giving their cell phone numbers out, but looking for a way where we can effectively not just go to Google Translate and try to hope we can get the information we need to families um, selectively. I frequently, I use School Messenger all the time to get big messages out to the entire community or even grade level. And that provides me the opportunity to translate uh, into highlight, you know, families chosen languages. Um, and it does have a character limit to a time. I'm not all that wordy, but sometimes lots of information has to be broken up. But there's not something that we have found that's so quick and easy for staff to be able to contact a parent and just say, hey, can you send in the permission slip? It's Vicki, you know, Miss Vicki at the front desk, so-and-so didn't send the permission slip. Then it's Vicki who's trying to get a hold of the parent um, and they're at work, so they're not able to respond quickly. Or So we're looking for ways like that. Um, and we have been discussing, I've lear I'm learning, that there may be a piece to School, School Messenger, Messenger. <laughs> that will allow us to do that. Um, I also think for some of our families, um, they are not always at their computer. So checking their email may not be something that they are able to do quickly. Um, oftentimes I think checking a text and being able to respond quickly is something that is something that they could access. Um, so looking for something like that I think is gonna be important. And I, I feel as though, I know we're trying to centralize some things, but partnering with the Family Engagement Center is gonna be really important because a lot of our community relies on us in our building. The people in the community, when there's new families that move in, they say, oh, go see Vicki or go to Thompson. They can help you with the registration or they can help you get this document and things like that. Um, so I think somehow coming up with some protocols or structures that allow us to also still have the family engagement in our, in our area is gonna be important. Um, yeah, no, no. thank Dr. you. That's that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Just Dr. to add to that, um, Ms. Donato is on the working group with Ms. Yes. Pierre Sorry. that is focused on community family engagement, where some of these conversations about tools that would make it easier for us to communicate with families in a more immediate way, particularly who use different modes of communication, because we make an assumption that everybody's on email, they're not. Um, and so I'm thrilled to have Ms. Donato on that working group because the challenge is that we experience with communication with families, many of them impact families at Thompson. And so your perspective on that particular working group is really valuable, as well as that perspective around how we make sure that the schools are still the hubs for family connection, even though we have a family welcome center to provide resources to make that possible. So thinking about how we're at once very local and centralizing processes so that they're consistent is something that working group's gonna be thinking about a lot. Great, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Cardin. Um, so this year we, we gave you an inclusion specialist instead of another classroom because you don't have room for a classroom. And originally that was for grades, I think one and two, but one ended up not being overly so oversized compared to other schools. So how are you, util can you t just talk briefly about how you're utilizing that position and how it's working out, whether it's helping or not? We, sure, we haven't yet filled that position. Ah, okay. We are working to fill it. Um, the applications for most of our open positions have not been many this year. It's been an interesting year to try to hire even for um, a social worker was a position we had open at the end of the year. Um, so trying to have enough of a pool to do some interviews to be able to hire is where we're at. We actually do have uh, interviews that we're going to schedule. We have a handful of candidates now. Um, so. I think once we are able to hire the person, their strengths, where they've been, their experience, that will also help us shape where we wind up utilizing them. Great, thanks. Thank you. And we appreciate the position. We're just, <laughs> when it's filled, Fine we're really one. looking forward to being able to utilize them. Okay, 
Mr. Shortman. Okay. Uh, one of the weaknesses of the MCAS on the elementary level is you're only doing three grades. And so if you're doing a year-to-year -year comparison, you lose your fifth grade, you get a new third grade. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you've got a relatively small cohort of African-American and Hispanic Latino kids. So that when I see that kind of pattern, I'm just wondering if that's a cohort effect. And I don't expect you to know the answer tonight, but I know that you're going to go and do, today, do the data dive sure. so that the exercise that you should be thinking about as you're going forward is to take a look at the co co uh, cohort effect. Your growth numbers are good, so I, th I think that you're pro you probably are dealing with a cohort effect that's uh, making that graph look funny. Um, the one, the one thing I want to uh, uh, is your attendance data. Mm -hmm. um, on one level, you're telling me that the African American students have a significantly higher attendance uh, absentee rate, which is true for chronically absent. Your 25 percent of the African American students are chronically absent, compared to 17.7 percent of the whole student population. But overall. For the attendance rate for African American kids is 94.2 compared to 93.7. The average number of attendance is 10.2 compared to 11.2 for the whole school. So in every attendance category except for the uh, chronically absent, your African American kids are performing better than the school as a whole, which indicates to me that you've got 25% of your kids in that cohort group which are really struggling with attendance. Mm -hmm. And 75% of the kids in that cohort group who just come to school no matter what. So um, I, I think that in terms of crispness of discussion, we, internally within the community, as you're looking at kids walking in the door, I think it's also important to rec recognize that within that cohort, 75% of them are your all stars. So being more crisp here I think is just important both for the, for, for the kids and for visualizing the community. But I, I thought your progress in terms of what we can see from the test scores is impressive. So I'm going to come back with the, the two questions that I asked Mr. Dingman uh, uh, in terms of basically the uh, literacy program is a huge, huge thing. Uh, How's that going relative to everything you need to do, and what do you need from us? Sure. I think well, the literacy program, with any change, and a big change like this, I feel like obviously is going to come with some growing pains. I feel like for our teams right now that are implementing it, it's it's a huge change. It's a lot of work. They're mm -hmm. they are constantly in early. Not that they weren't before, but they're in early. They're printing. They're trying to be ahead of what's coming next. Um, I love the collaboration that I'm seeing with our special educators, with our ML teachers, with our coaches, with those cohorts in particular. Um, I think, you know, I often, I've said this to Dr. Holman before, um, time is always a factor and I know, you know, we've got our constraints on that, whether it's an, including financial constraints. I think we want to make sure that we continue to be competitive salary-wise. Mm -hmm. I feel like I lost a couple of key players this year to neighboring mm -hmm. districts who pay more. So I think that's going to be important for us. Um, Thank you for saying that. That's important to have on the table when it happens. We need to know about that. Sure. And I think, too, we are, we, we are continuing to feel the effects of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, while we have... I feel like we are well-staffed, we've got a lot of resources, and I don't necessarily know that I have the one thing, the magic wand that Thad referred to, um, but I, I give my teachers permission, I think this is really important, that there are going to be times where they can't continue to forge ahead in a lesson. You have to stop, you have to build, continue to build a relationship with students, mm -hmm. you have to let them know that you hear them, you see them, that they're struggling, and it's okay, mm -hmm. and we're going to help them. Um, and I find that some teachers can do that really well, and then other teachers just continue to feel the pressure of wanting to you do what they're expected to do curriculum-wise as well. So how do I find that balance for them? How do, I, how do they find that balance for themselves? Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think we're gonna feel this for a few years. I mean, uh, just thinking of mm -hmm. where we see some struggle right now, it's in our younger grades with some of our students and their emotional regulation, their social skills development. Mm -hmm. um, so giving staff and our support staff, and Chris and I also spend a lot of time supporting the kids ourselves um, so that instruction can continue for the rest of the class. But we have to find ways to allow for some more time in those areas too. And I know part of what is um, a part of EL is that they're gonna continue by doing, having protocols, being able to find ways where kids can feel that they're part of the conversation regardless of maybe their background knowledge or what they did over the weekend or what they got as holiday gifts, right? Like finding those ways so that the kids, that, that SEL is gonna be embedded in some of the work of EL. So trying to find and highlight some of those practices is gonna be really important because we don't have enough time to also have a cell block in our day while we do EL, while we do math, while we do science, social studies, and specials. Um, and I'd say for Thompson, what we see is that there's a lot of crossover in our focal groups. You know, we don't just have the, high, the mm -hmm. um, students on IEPs. The students on IEPs might also be the students of color, or might also be the ML students, or, you know, so there's a lot, or the students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So as we try to support them throughout the school day, um, without necessarily pulling them for missing core instruction, we have to find the way so that they are still getting the support that they need and feel as though they belong and are part of the class and the grade level and have something to offer. That was kind of a long-winded explanation, but I just think it's a really important factor for us. Time is huge, and finding the time to address some of the social-emotional needs that we're seeing is, is gonna continue to be something that we see over the next few years. When I was a principal, the worst days were the days when the social worker was absent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Okay, I had, I just wanted to comment two questions, and these were actually kind of for both of you, but um, first, I was just wondering how effective is Dibbles for students in grade three where they're, a lot of them are starting to understand how to read? And I'm, I'm just thinking if you're doing nonsense words that it start, to me it feels like it would start getting confusing, right? Because they're not words, they're, and I don't know how it's done. So maybe I'm totally wrong. Nonsense words cuts off the second grade after the second, right? No, you end up with 11 to 13. Yeah, it continues. I think it tells us if kids, so the, the, the operating theory of the research is if students are struggling to decode too many words, then it's gonna affect their comprehension. So it does give us by third grade information over which of our students are really still uh, in that area of need. They also start in second grade to use a, a quick dipstick around comprehension called a maze assessment. And, I'm, and um, I think that's where we, got, we have more to learn. Because really, this is all about helping students um, be able to read fluently and to support their growing comprehension. We see in our MCAS scores that, that that's what really MCAS is looking at very closely is their comprehension skills, um, some of their written skills. Okay. And I think too, what we were finding as we were doing the initial um, assessments this year, some of the scores that may have flagged for a particular student, may, and especially in the upper grades, was around the maze. And we had to take time to kind of look at what the kids, what the student's response was, because it's a timed assessment. So just because a student may have flagged as you know a, a lower or well below in that particular area, if you go in student by student, you can see that actually they only answered seven, but they answered all seven correctly. <laughs> so you know there's some cause for like not just taking it as it says, oh, they're flagged, we've got it right mm -hmm. away. But we need to dig a little deeper for some students and take a look at some specific, some okay. of the responses. Thank you. And then the other thing was sparked from a conversation I had just before the meeting with Ms. Morgan, that we were thinking about how the community around elementary schools is so different than it was for our two oldest daughters um, where when we 
were dropping off or picking up most there was a lot more people interacting and now we have you know partly because the demographics of town have shifted we have more two-parent families we more have more just kind of drive up drop off and less interaction and then that's combined with covid and COVID's this overlay where you have a whole cohort of people who never met in kindergarten. And that's really where most people kind of, you know, that's where you get, get your community. And Ms. Donato has had a lot of mentioned things where they're trying to bring the families into schools. And I think that's just so important right now because we need to come we need to have some other ways that we're building these communities, which before happened more organically and for some are broken. And now they're kind of the role models for the earlier. We, we, you know, we kind of broken something and we have to kind of rebuild it just like you've been talking about. Um, and the other thing is like, and I'm not saying we've done something wrong, but like not having class lists, not having um, phone books and stuff, all these things are things that have made it more difficult to build community outside of school. And to me, that has an effect on the community that's inside of school, because if the parents feel part of, more part of this school, it's easier for them to convey that, you know, that's the message that they give the kids. And anyway, I'm just, I'm mentioning that because it came up and I hadn't really, I don't know, somehow our conversation made it really clear or, or more um, apparent to me. And I thought I'd pass that on because it, it, I heard that kind of in both of your presentations. Yeah, so. I think that's, I think that's really true. And I'd say, it, I feel like it's hit us a little bit harder than just hearing dad report about like his volunteerism is up volunteerism is up his pto board is full we are not in that place and i don't know that it's i don't know that it's necessarily that people don't want to be involved it's more like time constraints or jobs have shifted or family dynamics have shifted and we need to try to hear from those people who maybe not be at the table all the time to know what what can we do to make this more accessible to you as well, not just, you know. Yeah. Could I add one thing to that? And this is, so I'm, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of uniquely Dallin, I'm thinking about it as a building leader and I'm thinking about it as a parent um, in our system. And what I hear from our PTO that I think I hear in other places too is they don't just want to be invited into school, they want to understand the learning, they want to be invited into the learning. Mm -hmm. And that's something our PTO has asked us specifically this year, like, we, we want to do all these things, we want to be intentional about bringing people in and, and embracing the, um, you know, diversity in our community, but also we want to come in and see what our kids are learning right. and how our kids are learning and know about that. So that's, a, that's the challenge they've given us this year. Great, thank you very much. Great. So thank, thank you, you both. everybody. Thank you both. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Janger with the AHS Heterogeneous Grouping Initiative Update. Fresh off of a meeting about the move <laughs> and ready to move into a new building. We're going to play Pink Floyd all day. Gonna, oh, yeah, we're over there. We're over. <laughs> We'll, I'll, we'll make sure you know where to go <laughs> for the next meeting. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably know better mm -hmm. where to go than we will. Entrance on Mill Street. Yeah. Keep, keep coming in the same way you did come in before. You know that funny little building in the back that, that uh, is coming off of Mill Street that's about, uh, like three stories tall? That's where we're going to be. Oh, fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're separating us from the real teaching and learning. I think you guys are us with preschool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Tell me when to go. So hopefully this is, you know, a relatively short presentation. Um, you may have lots of questions um, because what I'm focused on presenting today, you can go to the next slide, 
is just this review of um, grades from the end of last year. So we finally got the punchline on those. We've been looking at semester grades before. And then the participation rates for the fall. Um, and then I'm happy to answer questions about sort of how the fall is going. Um, so chugging right along. So just a quick recap. I'll go quickly through these. Um, so this is just a reminder of the slide that I keep putting up of what we said we were going to be looking at in terms of measuring the success of this pilot program. Um, and so today, as I said, we're looking at participation in honors and student grades. Next slide. Um, so going forward, I'll be back here in December when we will have uh, term one grades um, to look at. So we'll have one more data point for the fall and we'll have finished conversations with the English 9 um, and probably English 10 teachers and be coming to you with some sort of proposal about what we see as the next phase. And as I understand it, there are three questions that we'll be looking at in December, and those are going to be, well, primarily, do we continue the um, heterogeneous grouping in English 9, whether or not we consider rolling it forward or into English 10, and whether we think of any modifications in the format around heterogeneous grouping for things like honors for all. Um, next step. So now we are up to the final grades. So if you go to slide six, yep. So these charts are all a little bit hard to read um, for various reasons. One of the things just in terms of data points for good vis data visualization for those of you who are sticklers for good data visualization. This is not a trend chart that can be looked at reliably because the distance between the dots is not the same as the distance between the grades. Um, what you're looking at there on the far right is the end of year grades for school year 23, so last year. That's the main new data point. But I've left on this chart the quarter one grades just so we can see the relationship between those. Then we have for the previous year, the end of year grades, that's SY22, Y1, and the previous year's quarter one grades. So again, we can see the relationship between the quarter one and quarter two grades. Um, and then I wanted to go back to previous comparison years where we had um, leveled classes. So if you went back to school year 2020, the problem was that our end of year grades were already into COVID. So I did not put the end of year grades for 2020. That's why there's only quarter one grades there. And then I had the end of year grades for year um, for SY19 going back. So it's a little bit of a apple, um, apples to oranges. But if you look we, at the comparison years, it would be the end of year grades for SY19 to the end of year grades for SY22, which is now heterogeneous, and to the end of year grades for SY23. The punchline is very similar to what we found at the beginning of last year, which is that the grades overall are stable, um, that the lower line, which you see in the blue line going down, is that under heterogeneous grouping with a large proportion of the higher performing students who would have been in level A are now at level H, but not getting lower grades. And so that's why the red line stays stable the yellow line stays stable even though it's a lot more kids, and the blue line drops. And that's consistent with our recommendation to students, which has been if you're getting an A in level A, we think you should probably try level H. Um, so students who thought they were going to get A's in level A have moved up to level H. Next slide. I'm trying not to have to turn my head backwards the whole time. Um, so then the tables that follow are just because my labeling isn't great, so you can see this in table form. So the next slide is even harder to read. Next one. Um, because there's so many of these. Uh, but again, you want to be looking at that light blue dot to the green dot to the red, red bar to the blue bar. And again, what you'll see is at the end of the year, grades remain relatively stable. Um, and... Um, they're either the better equal to the previous year or better than the earlier years. And you can see the same thing a little bit better if you pop down two more to the grades by gender, where again you'll see that the grades in recent, the post COVID years were stable and they were better than the pre COVID years. 
that is the grade reports. Um, I did break the grades out by um, race, ethnicity, by level, but because our numbers within each of those subcategories is relatively small, I didn't report it out by level. There's only between about 30 and 18 in each of those categories. If you divide that in half, you're starting to have ends under 10, which I don't want to report those grades on. Um, all right, so now distribution by race. So now if you'll go down. Next slide. So now we're up to participation rates. So the good news is, keep, oh, that, you gave us that one. You put in the one I asked you to put in. That slide is not in the materials that I sent to you, but just for context, I wanted to show this information. Um, so as you can see, the breakdown is relatively small in each of the categories, and that's consistent across the years. And that's why I don't break out the subcategories by level, even though I did look at that. Next slide. So the punchline is that the percentage of students participating in honors has continued to remain high. It actually went up by about 5%, so it's now over 70% for this year. And then if you go down further, you can break that out. And now because they are four compar comparable years, I drew the little trend lines. Um, and so as you'll see, although they bounce around in some of the smaller categories, the overall trend is upwards. So if you look at um, the, the, the subcategories that were the most volatile would be for African-American students, whereas you can see in 2020 there were none. In 2022 there were only about 25%, and then it jumped up to um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60%. It's gone down to about 47%, I think you can see on the chart this year, um, but it's still about twice as high as it was in previous years. And so the overall trend lines, although volatile in the small groups, remain positive. You'll see the same thing in gender. Again, the trend lines go up. Um, the sort of gaps remain pretty similar over the years. And if you look, go down then to IEP status, you'll see a really significant impact. So if you sort of round off your numbers, mm -hmm. for IEP students, almost about four times as many students in IEPs are participating in honors level curriculum, about twice as many African American students, comparable proportions for Hispanics and multiracial students. And I believe that is it. That is the whole presentation. Um, I can also speak to just quickly, um, I spoke to the English teachers today just to talk a little bit about what they've been working on. They met over the summer. They're going through the same pattern that we did last year. They met over the summer to review the panorama data, to review the participation data, um, to talk about what they saw in terms of discourse and practice. Um, they are focusing heavily on um, both sort of classroom citizenship, academic discourse, which is a focus both in their classes and throughout the school, um, and thinking about what they mean by high expectations for all students, because that was an area of particular focus. And I brought, and I left it back here. Hold on one second. So this is just a focus on really thinking about how they create a collaborative classroom environment. So they wanted to have consistent practices across. There's similar work being done around having sim similar um, specific instruction on academic conversation. And that's something I'll actually talk about during my SIP presentation, so I won't go on too long for that. That's it. Questions? Questions? Um, thank you. This was helpful. Can we get an update about what was said at the chat that we had? So I heard about it on Facebook. Love getting my information from there. Um, but I don't know if, if it's accurate. So it would be helpful to know what, um, what was said then around, particularly around expansion. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. That was a few weeks ago. Um, from what I 
recall, I, what I can't imagine I would have said any differently about expansion is that we are not, like, to Dr. Jinger's point, what he has on here is that if we're considering recommendations for a program of studies to discuss around this particular pilot, that this pilot is isolated to conversations about English at the high school. Um, there was a community member who was there to ask particularly questions about mathematics. Uh, we had some discussion about um, if we were to consider any changes in mathematics, first of all, that's not something that's on the table right now for this year, for next school year. Um, but the math is a different discipline that you have to take a measured approach to any leveling practices you're going to adjust in any discipline that our priority is always going to be to involve members of the community in that. Um, and that if anything, what I think this pilot has taught us is that we want to provide more opportunities for more students to level up. The results we've shown at the high school this year are that more students are participating in more high level classes, more um, classes that are considered uh, rigorous by the state. And that's a positive trend and that's the, that's the goal. So if we do any adjustment of leveling practices that it's towards that end, um, and if we were to do that in mathematics, then what we would look to do is provide more students with access to the rigorous mathematics courses and make sure that we have additional doses of support for those students who might need it in order to access that. We did some differentiation between what, because I think um, sometimes there's not understanding about what the difference is between Math 7 and Math 7A. So there were questions about at the middle level what the difference is between those two. It's the difference of two units in the math classes. Um, and what we would do to make sure students have the ability to differentiate when they get up into high school. So once they get through, uh, up into the high school space, how much latitude they have to choose a direction in a discipline, in a mathematics discipline or any other discipline that they have. Um, but we didn't say anything specific about plans to expand or not because we were very specific. This pilot is for ELA right now at the high school. So grade I don't nine know what or was grade 10 or I don't remember so talking the, well, about that. Well, the, the message that I heard was that, that, that um, there were not plans to expand beyond grade nine at this point. Um, but maybe that's not what was said. I don't know. I, I don't recall exactly what I said at a subcommittee maybe, meeting recently. Maybe like Jeff was says. there, but he's not oh. here, so. No, this was at the chat, so it's on a subcommittee meeting. It was school committee relations subcommittee meeting, I believe. It's the chat, though. It's it was not the chat. chat. It was the okay. chat. School committee chat. Yeah. So it was a public meeting. Right. Well, ish. Yeah. 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 Anyway. I'm just curious about what was said. So yeah. that would know. be helpful. If it's, yeah. If it's, okay. Um, what's your question? Okay. So last year's freshmen are, are now sophomores. Correct. Do we have data on how many of them? How they sorted into sophomore English. Roughly 65% continued, so it's a comparable percentage. Okay, so 65% of all students who were, I, I, I just want to, you're saying that 65% were not. Roughly 65% of the expressions students, which is sophomore English, mm -hmm. general ed English, mm -hmm. roughly 65% of those students are participating in honors this year. Okay. So the percentage that would last year sustained into this year. That was sort of what I'm, tr yeah. what I wanted to hit. So that we've got more kids in sophomore honors now as a result of what we did last year. Correct. Although the percentage was relatively high last year, mm -hmm. and I need to do a deeper dive to mm -hmm. try to disaggregate cohort effects from um, general effects. Yeah, that's sort of an interesting question, is what happened in sophomore year as a result of what we did in yeah, freshman year, it, because it, sophomores totally um, unaffected by what we did in well, freshman year. It appears, yeah. I mean, we had 67% of students in, mm -hmm. in freshman in, in honors mm -hmm. in ninth grade English last year. Mm -hmm. We have roughly 65% in honors in expressions this mm -hmm. year. So we mean maintained a high percentage this year. So when we're doing grades, uh, first semester grades, it would be also helpful to track the 10th grade grades as well. Okay. Um, the other question is, is that the reason why we got into ninth grade English is because it was the ninth grade English teachers were excited about doing this as a result of how they taught 
during the pandemic when everybody was forced together. The other group of teachers that was before us telling us, yes, 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 we want to play, were the science teachers. So I, I don't want to go anywhere near math because that's a whole different discipline. But I, I think that one of the biggest things for making this kind of thing successful is the enthusiasm of the teachers for going forward in, in this. Uh, what are you hearing from our science teachers? So my understanding from the science teachers is that they are interested, but at this point they're really working on, one of the reasons why we stepped back on that was because, again, there are curricular changes mm -hmm. that need to happen within science that mm -hmm. had already happened in math. I mean, sorry, in, in, in English. English. Yeah. Um, and so they're still working on that. We've also had some turnover in the staff, mm -hmm. so making sure that everybody is on board. Mm -hmm. It's a smaller cohort, right, mm -hmm. because in the sciences, it's physical science teachers mm -hmm. specifically, so whereas an English department has, it has a bigger more sort, than 20 yeah. people mm -hmm. to, to pull people from, we have you know, four or five folks who are teaching physical science. And so that's the other, the other question is, within the community of teachers at Arlington High, how many of you sat up and take note, t taken notice and either want to play or have an opinion? I mean, in general, our impression is that there's a pretty strong, I mean, again, it depends on the content area and it depends on the particular class. Mm -hmm. So the idea that in ninth grade physical science and potentially ninth grade world history, mm -hmm. that you might do this so that the ninth grade experience mm -hmm. was more inclusive and students were having more of a common exposure to high level curriculum in high school, that's something that people are interested in. As Dr. Homan said, math is another conversation. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there's, right now, we've done the work in English, we've seen that it's successful in English, and there's a much bigger conversation going on about how do we give all students access to high-level curriculum and how do we encourage deeper learning across the school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think right now everyone wants to sort of hit the pause button on the heterogeneous English is the solution to everything. Um, or heterogeneity is the solution to everything, and think about how we have our practices be rigorous across those classes and those curricula be aligned. I would think that other teachers in this content area, the big one I'm thinking is, is history social studies, is that if they're uh, assigning written assignments to, to students, uh, in tenth, say in 10th grade right now, they should be seeing stronger products as a result of their stronger literacy skills. I mean, and, and one of the things we've said about this, right, is because inclusion in general mm -hmm. increases opportunities for students mm -hmm. and increases the advantages and benefits of the diversity of our community, mm -hmm. they may not, even if they're not seeing better, if they're seeing the same, mm -hmm. and they were already seeing pretty good skills amongst our students, mm -hmm. right, that is a vote in favor of being able to continue inclusion in that mm -hmm. modest that in ninth grade and in tenth grade potentially. I, I think the data is impressive, so uh, I just want to take every opportunity I can to explore the next steps of what the ripples of this project are throughout the school, which I think uh, if we're looking for, we're going to see a lot of them. I mean, I will say this, right? We do a lot of large scale or other mm -hmm. efforts to sort of impact student achievement. Mm -hmm. And the effect sizes are often fairly small, right? We're looking at fairly small changes over mm -hmm. time to have moved almost 20% of the class, right, from, mm -hmm. um, or 15, I can't remember, 19%, depending on whatever the numbers are, but of the class into honors level curriculum with their grades still being the same mm -hmm. and seeing the positive impact is, is a pretty significant effect size. Yeah, we threw a big rock in the pond. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I guess my question, I mean, first, I am very impressed at the increase in participation for students of color, IAPs, et cetera. Um, I guess for me, for it to be, and, and I think that's a really good reason to try and make this work, but I would also, I'm, I'm still thinking about the parents who were concerned how rigor was going to be delivered for students who in, if they're in a non-heterogeneous world would have been in the honors classes. Um, 
and their concerns that their students wouldn't get the same, that the experience that they get in the heterogeneous class would not be similar to what they get in the separated classes, the homogeneous classes. So I guess I'm wondering how that's going. I mean, I see no evidence that students are getting a less rigorous experience than they were previously. And I see ample extra evidence that they're getting a more rigorous experience than they were previously. These teachers have looked at examples of student work before and after. They looked at examples of student work and what their expectations were and what high expectations were in English, what kinds of discourse, what kind of writing skills, what kind of reading skills they were expecting and how they accessed them. They've done common grading and normed their practices across those, and they, they are delivering to students. I mean, they are the assessors of that student achievement, mm -hmm. um, and they are relatively reliable, and they're saying that the students are performing higher, right, because what they're saying is that now 65 to 70, well, last year, 67% of the students were earning an equivalent grade, but now at the honors level, and they are rating that work against past honors work. They're the same teachers, they're norming on the same standards, they're working together collectively in terms of norming that practice. Um, so know, that's not exactly the question that I'm asking, though, which is for the students who would have picked honors in a in, in the homogeneous classes, would they be learning more, even more, which is what the parents felt. But, but I, I guess that I think I am answering the question because if I'm a student who took honors last year yeah. and I got a B, and I took honors this year and I got a B, mm -hmm. I was doing the same rigorous work both years. And we are seeing that those students are still doing and achieving the same rigorous work in this different setting. When we looked at the panorama data and we asked the students, did you learn a lot? They said, I learned a lot. Did the teacher make the class interesting? The teacher made the class interesting. Um, was the teacher, you know, I mean, they, th those things were in there. The one which we've already commented on, right, is the four questions or five questions on engagement and the one on um, teacher expectations, um, which, you know, we will, we will work to uh, this, we, we will work to try to understand that and to sort of figure out, look at how that changes this year. It's something the teachers have studied and they're working on looking at that question around engagement. Um, we've had a lot of conversations in here about how to interpret the one question about expectations. But other than that, everything we can see from the teachers is that the students are produ pr producing the same rigorous high level work. They're the same teachers assessing the students on the same standards um, and more rigorously than they had in the past because they've had a lot of time to really work out that question of what does rigorous work look like. And so we're seeing that high level of performance. And the students reported relatively high quality classes overall. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else, any other questions? Oh, please. I'm going to chime in on that just because I teach heterogeneous classes. The way you design them is not to design for the middle and accelerate up. It's you design at the top and then scaffold and modify to get everybody up there. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who's concerned that having a heterogeneous class is going to take down the level of rigor, it, it's not. You keep it up there. You're just building in more supports to get other people up, mm -hmm. if that helps. Okay. No, that's helpful. Thank you. And, and the experience in reporting from the teachers is that the level of discourse and conversation in the classes is improved mm -hmm. by having a more diverse group of students. Great. Okay. Anything more? No. no. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Sanders. Thank you very much. Finance report number one, Mr. Mason. Which one do you want to start with, the enrollment or the report? Well, we can start with the, the finance report because that's helpful. And then we'll go from there. 
Thank you, though, for clapping. Good evening, school committee members. Um, I was going to try to make this more pretty a slide deck, but uh, we've been working on the so in the business office. So, um, so uh, I, tonight you have the memo for the first finance report, which is for financials as of October 24th. Um, this was as of Tuesday, the night that was sent over to you, or right before. I mean, right. And um, at this moment, uh, we are about uh, 18 percent, 18 to 19 percent obligated in terms of what we've already spent, and um, that's around 16.6 million dollars in the general fund, and uh, 77 percent uh, encumbered at this point, which would include that uh, salaries um, and all other contracted services, instructional materials that we're anticip anticipating spending on um, at this point. Um, however, department heads are still trying to determine what they're going to spend their funds on um, um, based on their needs or getting their all of their orders in place. Um, some notables for the, the, the general fund um, is that there were obviously we're still hiring for some positions and so you'll see that at the top that um, we have uh, we have some um, some salary savings currently, um, but uh, I, I would hold off and wait until we fill some more positions to decide to we're going to move on that. Um, and then all those savings are tied mm -hmm. to just n newer positions coming in at lower salary rates. We have some vacancies still substantial in uh, facilities. Uh, their maintenance team is still um, they're half half capacity. I mean filled at the half rate. They have about six vacancies in that department. Um, so they're probably going to still use a lot of contractor services to do the work. Um, you know, normally the facilities department would encumber uh, the power, electricity, um, and natural natural gas line, line items over the course of the year in pieces. Uh, so this year we've actually encumbered the total projection up front. Um, I'm going to inquire about the natural gas item and why that's uh, slightly off. I think that's under encumbered, but that was what they were uh, was directed to ensure that we had enough funds up front. Uh, we were seeing that there was a higher electricity uh, usage last year and this year with new buildings and then new rates kicking in. Um, also, we've hired our new building systems manager and we have to backfill uh, maintenance position. So that's where we are with facility lines. Um, and another major, the main driver, um, we budgeted a much higher amount for um, tuition. Uh, so we were anticipating 14% um, increases and those have happened, but then there's also, um, once again, a reduction in enrollment not, um, due to aging out of students. Uh, and we're down to 55 out of district students, but I, I'm, I'm understanding that there's a couple of placements that. Are, um, that might be be, make, be made uh, or there are uh, extended evaluations that may be happening. So that's a number that we will, should continue to look at. Um, and that's it for the general fund portion. Um, the revolving funds, um, we're gonna, we have to do some couple maintenance of due to the close of the year. There was uh, some issues on the budget size, but in terms of the actual spending, this is as well as as of October. 24th and um, I don't have any notable uh, uh, items to mention besides that hopefully in the next period we should see uh, more revenue for our after-school rental programs um, for those that are tracking that um, and then you'll have your grant uh, the grants account report um, Nothing at this point to really note besides that we're still, we, we made a last minute amendment to some grants um, and due to uh, the state changing their systems over to a new accounting system for us to track grants, which is called GEMS. So when making an amendment, it's causing a holdup to then to give us our final uh, record of award. Not we've, We're entitled to these grants, we're gonna get the funding, um, but the, those accounts are then held by the comptroller to not be set up with amounts, so they're being withheld from this report. 
Um, but they should uh, be in. Time out. Can you tell us what page you're on and where you're? Oh, I'm sorry. That is this? on the grant accounts report. Page. So that's page 11. So you'll see the note. Thank you for slowing mm -hmm. me down. Um, so, and there's a note there that mm -hmm. the report is missing. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I should have, I forgot that you had it up there. Don't worry. So grant accounts report on, uh, you see, you'll see there's a note that Title I and special education uh, uh, IDEA grants, are, we're still waiting for our final approval for allocation okay. so that we can set those accounts up in use. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. But as an entitlement grant, we've been allocated the dollars. It's not that we're not going to get these dollars. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that it's not on this report because the accounts are not set up and the expenditures are posting somewhere else temporarily. Um, for that, I can stop and answer any questions on any of the pages. I'm sorry I didn't slow down. I forgot that she was running one point on that and I was just kind of going through the pages. Any <laughs> questions? Trustee. Anything in here giving you angst or anxiety or stomach medicine? Um, no, not yet. I think I'm concerned <laughs> is the utility rates, you know, so yeah. and, and how the utilities play. I think hearing that this winter may be a rougher winter, you know, I mean, those are the things that I, I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that we have funds to make sure we get through that. Obviously switching the high school out of that building, out of this building and moving over there should, from what I remember from previous reports, it's going to have an impact on utilities as Correct. well. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now you have a building that's more spaces that are being ventilated at a higher capacity and cooled later on at a high, higher capacity and even heated. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's going to cost a little bit more. But, but more efficient, too. More efficient yeah. and more comfortable mm -hmm. So for the students. So, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Um, so I guess more of a, a suggestion than a question. When we have positions like the inclusion specialist that we heard about tonight that we are still planning to fill, mm -hmm. it would be helpful to have those funds reserved somewhere rather than them falling into the balance looking like we can go spend it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can't encumber it because you don't have anybody in that position, right? Mm -hmm. So you could, but you could put it in the projected expenditure column. Yeah, I could add it. I didn't, usually when I do add it, uh, I will make note of that when I speak to it. But in this projection, I did not do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, anything more? So this is, I don't know that you will know the answer, mm -hmm. but I saw that the MSBA has made changes about funding projects, and I just wonder, is that affecting our project? Because it talked about prior, projects already ongoing and but they didn't give what I was reading didn't give any uh, details about which exactly which ones it talked about nine ones and 30 30 projects and stuff I haven't heard anything at, from my end I will look into that to see how if it impacts us I'd imagine we would know if if whatever change would have impacted us so at this point I haven't been informed of any of that okay yeah, and I'll, so I'll get back and, and send an email, huh? It was yeah, it was just it was just released and, yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. you know, uh, but this I'm just looking for more money, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, from the state, yeah. uh, and it, it was increasing the reimbursement rates for site work and for square footage and and stuff, and it talked about the stuff which we have seen in the building project as we have gone along and it will apply to the people who are now going but it also talked about applying to projects which were approved before 2022 so that's where I'm like oh maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> keep our so, fingers crossed so yeah so I, yeah. I see I see the buzz going on but I I don't know the exact impact so I'll okay. look into it yeah yeah no I'm just curious thank you um, okay anything more on this seeing none uh, and then you were going to yes. talk about, okay. So I, I was going to suggest that we actually look at the enrollment numbers, uh, projections at budget subcommittee since they're not final and that was my intent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll just have this shared as for everyone's information and then yeah. they'll be discussed it. So I think we're good. Thank you. 
Um, so moving on. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense because they're not certified yet and stuff. So we don't want people yeah. in the audience thinking something and then it turns out not to be May, what. May, Please. Um, would you, I, I think the, the, they're going to be certified, I think, m either by, the, by tomorrow or midweek next week so yeah there's no rush um okay. so i mean we pr i plan <laughs> i'll say in but in committee report budget is going to meet in early november so we'll go over it then thanks okay superintendent's update all right a uh, quick fall athletics update we have uh, had 556 students who registered for tryouts this fall 491 of them made it onto a team roster and we have some um, impressive results to share the aps golf team has qualified for its state tournament our girls soccer, field hockey, football, and volleyball teams are on track for the straight, uh, state tournament. As was already mentioned by our students, our girls cross country team is having a fantastic season. It's undefeated 4-0, boys cross country at 2-2. Two and two. Our girls swimming and cheering is preparing for the Middlesex League meet. We have a lot of swimmers and cross country runners ready to participate in state meets. Um, and winter athletic signups began this week. Our Nordic ski team will begin its very first season as a varsity sport, and we're looking forward to that. We had our launch of our all district professional development last week. The feedback was just as wonderful as it was last school year. We have a really exciting list of courses that I talked about the last time I had an update. Um, and we had some really high participation and excitement about this year's offerings. We went to our Deeper Learning Dozen convening this week. We have an expanded team that includes Ms. Keys, um, one of our math coaches at the elementary level, building principal, uh, curriculum director, as well as several members of the cabinet team. Um, we did a lot of learning this time around about uh, systems change and how our strategies and are impacted by the mindsets that we carry into the transformation work that we're doing and the equity work that we're doing. We spent a lot of time at Harvard um, hearing from professors who have done a lot of work around organizational and systems change this past week. Um, and it was a lot of fun and a lot of really intense learning. We're all um, tired, uh, but it was really great work. Our November 1st Professional Development Day is next week. We're doing a lot of um, effort around building some learning and planning time together, giving teachers as much time for guided planning and collaborative planning as we can, hearing uh, what Mr. Dingman and Ms. Donato said today about time being sort of of the essence when you're trying to do so much change. We're trying to prioritize giving people time so that they can do that change work. Um, and we're basing that on feedback that we got both from teachers and from students about what our teachers need on November 1st. And we're integrating that feedback into our plan for the day. Um, so we've shared that agenda out with everyone. We're making sure everybody knows where to go when um, and are looking forward to that day and giving teachers some additional challenges to build belonging and growth in the school. Our strategic plan working groups are meeting. We have two sessions that we've completed. They've met for, um, like I said, twice for about four hours total. This is designed as an action research oriented inquiry cycle team. So they're sort of intended to um, get together. The next thing they're going to do is identify voices that are missing on the working groups and get those voices into the groups. So right now it only consists of administrators. Uh, we wanted those groups to get together, sort of go look at the strategic plan, think about what some of the asks are of year one and then think about who do we need at the table in order to actually make those things happen. And so the next step is going to be inviting those voices into the working groups. Uh, I mentioned this before, but this is funded by an Arlington Education Foundation grant um, that is going to pay those who join the groups uh, for their time to participate in and contribute to the work <coughs> of the system. So we'll be doing that next. Uh, each team, e there are eight working groups. They are facilitated by two APS administrators who meet with the cabinet team once a month to do their planning. That planning is supported by a deeper learning district uh, coach, Kim Fruman, who was with us this week at the deeper learning. It's actually their deeper learning districts now. They're not calling themselves the deeper learning dozen because there's not a dozen of them. Um, but that work is supported um, through the work of that coach. And uh, your enrollments are in your packets. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about this or anything else. Okay. Any questions? So I want to point out that the buffer zone report was due this um, me at this meeting per policy. And it's my mistake that it didn't get to the agenda. So um, we'll have it for you. I mean, I'll, I'll request that it's ready for the next meeting. But that was my error. One question, sorry, you should have asked it while Dr. Jenga was here.
But um, do you do you know what the transition plan is for the high school? They're doing half days, or what? What's how that's going to work out? Yes. So they are doing two partial days, um, so two half days, with an early release at 11:45 to facilitate the move and rolling. Um, so that is to make sure that the movers can come in, be in the building while students are not in the building. Um, so they will move from that moment at the middle of the day when the students leave through the evening. Um, and then the following day, the teachers of the, uh, of the disciplinary area that moved, the students won't have class in that class. Um, the days are stacked such that um, the students have sort of a full day over two days. So they'll miss one class, even if the teachers have two periods over which they're moving. I have the full calendar and I'm happy to share that out with you if that's okay. helpful. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you something, I know I forgot. Oh well. Um, so next is superintendent evaluation materials. So I sent, um, I think about two weeks ago now, uh, materials to the committee. Um, they are on this website that is now posted in Novus, the link to it. You might need to copy and paste it into your browser to be able to see it. Um, just as a reminder, the I had a student learning goal, a professional practice goal, um, and then three district, two district improvement goals for three district improvement goals for this school year. Um, and so evidence is provided on the front page of the website for each of these goals uh, with an emphasis. I attempted to place a significant emphasis on student outcomes for goal one, which was to close opportunity and achievement gaps for students through uh, focus on instructional practice and classroom systems and structures. Um, the professional practice goal was to continue our focus on deeper learning practices across APS through participation in various um, professional organizations. I will note that the goal he written here is the goal that was approved for this past year um, for me to participate in new superintendent's induction. I've since, um, not no longer participating in that because the induction is um, done, but we're still participating in Deeper Learning District and other professional networks, including um, this year, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Network uh, and the full cabinet team is doing some work with that group. District improvement goal one was to create and develop a comprehensive five-year strategic plan for the district in collaboration with stakeholders. So there's evidence related to the work that was done in that area, which all of you have been deeply involved in. Goal two was to recruit and retain uh, diverse staff and continue to develop shared leadership structures to support continuous improvement. So there's uh, evidence of the work that we have done to support the continuous improvement of administrators, of staff, um, to continue to improve our recruitment practices and diversification practices in that area. And district improvement goal three was to refine and improve a collaborative values driven visionary and inclusive budget process. Mr. Mason and I did a lot of work around budget process last year based on feedback that was provided during my last evaluation. Um, and I've provided a little bit of evidence of that including some of the timeline around our organizational charts and the restructuring that has happened. Um, of the administration, of central office, and of some of the roles that we have throughout the district. Along the top um, is a reflection on some of these goals um, and a reminder that there are standard indicators associated with the superintendent's evaluation. So this is the document on this last tab that was approved by the school committee uh, back last January, uh, as well as the highlighted performance indicators that we chose and that you, or that I chose and that all of you approved. Um, the reflection is really focused on what those indicators were and I'm tr trying to provide a reflection aligned with those indicators and also reference any uh, evidence that's on the front page. So any issues navigating, please let me know. If there's anything that um, access issues with any of the documents on the front page, please let me know. Uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to see in evidence, I'm also happy to add to the site. Okay, so I will be providing you with an updated evaluation document um, probably over the weekend uh, and I will have a deadline for it. We will, uh, so that I can <coughs> create the summative uh, evaluation for our November 16th meeting. Um, and if you have any questions for the superintendent regarding more information or whatever, if you would CC me on them just so that I can see if there's like a uh, 
administrative problem or, or something that I want to make sure that everyone gets the information. Um, and is there any other questions or comments about this? Okay, seeing none. We good? Yeah. Um, so next we have the consent agenda. Uh, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 24085, $932,966.98, dated 10 23 School Committee draft minutes for the meeting of October 12, 2023. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's unanimous. And now we have subcommittee and liaison reports, uh, budget, Mr. Cardin. Uh, as I said, we'll look <laughs> for a meeting in early November to go over enrollments, um, start talking about the budget picture for next year. Okay. Community relations. Um, there was a school committee chat on October 17th. Um, Mr. Thielman and Ms. Gittleson attended, as well as a number of members of um, Dr. Harmon's cabinet team. And uh, my understanding is there were two um, community members that attended. Is that Ms. Gittleson, is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay. Um, we are having a subcommittee meeting on November 15th to follow up on the chat schedule and new protocol um, and also to discuss um, this advisory role of community um, groups to the school committee and APS. I can elaborate more on that once we have our meeting. <laughs> okay. Curriculum? Uh, we met earlier this week. We talked about the um, overnight experience at the Gibbs and special ed, and we are gonna meet again in January. Okay. Uh, facilities is not present. Um, anyone who's on it know anything? Okay. There's a meeting scheduled, I think, for next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, policy? Uh, we need to schedule a meeting. Okay. And building committee, it is moving. I mean, the high school is moving. We just heard about that, so. That's great. So are we. Yeah, that's right. We'll be in our ne new space next time. Our audience will not, I mean, anyone who wants to come see us will need to enter on Mill Street. Is that right? Millbrook. Millbrook. Yeah. Um, and uh, any liaison reports? None. Announcements? None. Future agenda items. None. Okay. Uh, next is adjournment. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> 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 All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Okay. <laughs> so that's unanimous. We are adjourned. <laughs>